Today is the 1st of June, 2020. And uh, for historical purposes, if this is viewed sometime in the far future, that the United States and the entire world is in crisis. That not only have we had a pandemic, but we have had uh, tremendous political turmoil and confusion. The economic situation is very difficult. And to add to all of that, that terrible things have been happening regarding uh, race and racism. I'd like to take some time with you this afternoon, and I'm hoping that you will watch this to the very end because I have some very specific ideas I'd like to share with you. So if you have any trust or interest in my teachings and the Buddha Dharma, please listen to the end. I'd like to talk to you uh, today about dark compassion. And interestingly, in the, my book, that on the 1st of June, we begin a new chapter in regarding compassion. And the entire month of June is a study and uh, Dharma concepts about compassion. And prefacing that chapter, which began today, uh, is an original essay, which is called Compassion and Racism. And so uh, please stay with me, I beg of you, uh, to, hear this, to hear this out. And I'm going to read to you uh, this essay. I begin. This is the book that I'll be reading from. It's Sensing Shades of Reality. And I would like to read to you my original essay, uh, which is called Compassion and Racism. <clears throat> Even though the followers of Mahayana Buddhism have been diligently examining, studying, and teaching about higher compassion for thousands of years, real compassion is an ideal that is still easily dismissed as too lofty, while easier but false forms of compassion are encouraged. One of the false but still somewhat beneficial alternatives to higher compassion is the practice of societal compassion. Although outwardly it appears to exemplify many characteristics of caring compassion, societal compassion comes with many strings and exceptions attached. Within the socially constructed needs of any individual society, the practice of practical compassion is, upon careful analysis, different from the way compassion is expressed by enlightened beings or, or taught in Buddhism. One destructive attitude instilled by most societies, often beginning in childhood, is pure and simple racism. Although we might believe that racism only means hatred of other races, it is more broad scope than that. It is like dark compassion. The general inconsistency that separates racist compassion from the more noble forms is that races can be kind, considerate, and generous with their own clan, the ones considered to be worthy of their kindness. This, har this harsh form of, of racism differs from the passive care aspect that society has for all its members. Society is given the right to impinge on the lives of those under its control, providing positive as well as provoking negative effects. Group thought demands that each individual must have compassion for their own kind, their own religious group, race, or common ethnic origin, but not for those who are outsiders. In everyday life, this actually seems quite normal. There are even subtle attitudes of racism that can be hidden in the guise of extreme competition, such as unreasonable dedication to one's own sports team. 
For someone cultivating higher compassion, such as a, a Mahayana scholar or a bodhisattva, neither the scope nor the severity of racism should matter. In a stricter sense, any, any action or intention that pits ourselves against others could very well be a form of bigotry. It might be helpful to change our high regard for societal compassion with its many mandates of propriety, propriety and view it at, as yet another seductive but false form of compassion. Misguided and uneducated loyalty will only feed the taproot of racism that has become blind to perceiving compassion in the light. Certainly, describing some of the poor methods of exp expressing compassion cannot define the entire scope of what compassion does mean, but there is some value in contemplating the different ways of caring for others, whether they are correct or not. The most value that we can gain by researching and understanding false compassion is to discover the poor influences that might be preventing our own connection to authentic compassion. Although society has a great deal to say about what is right and wrong, our families actually teach us the most about compassion. Of course, much of what we learned from them was excellent, but some of their ideas were really bad. Still, we had little choice but to learn them. As adults, some people feel both anger and regret that what they were forced to believe was discovered to be antithetical to their present, more cultivated view of compassion. It would be rare to find anybody who, as a child, was not encouraged to show inappropriate racist arrogance toward others. It is said that even dogs can be trained to be racist if they are repeatedly shown the object to be hated while people around them express a vile attitude toward the intended victim. Children can and are being trained to discard or openly hate others, and it seems as though both the innocent dog and the innocent child can become quite adept at prejudice. The lessons that may have been forced on us as innocent, trusting, and vulnerable youngsters can become so ingrained that in later life and under certain circumstances, we might discover that, that we are capable of actions that we would never ever consider if compassion had been our early guide. These default standards might continue to define our own values of compassion until and unless we make efforts to change. Even then, it's not so easy to change, and that is why we must actually work at it. We make sincere effort to develop our own deeper standards that make us capable of real compassion, not to become more spiritual or to become a holy person. What we really want is a fair shake at a normal life and to mature from that place. We each begin moral life with simple exposure, to the views, likes, and dislikes of others. Those who were exposed to bigotry have a more difficult time preventing hatred of select others from becoming part of their moral and ethical structure. A personal standard like this is certainly not correct morality, but it is a kind of morality that some are very proud of. Exclusionary racism has to start with emulating someone that you respect someone who shows you discri discrimination rather than tells you about it. This energetic demonstration also gives every indication that this is how to get along in the world by using intolerance as a guide. Those who are mentally strong enough to break free of harmful influences will eventually get their feet on, own feet on the ground to, to think and decide for themselves if what they had been exposed to is what they want. Harsh attitudes that are learned early in life can still remain as subtle influences embedded in the subconscious mind and only later unearthed through sincere and honest meditation work. Even many advanced meditators can be shocked to uncover 
poor attitudes of racism lurking within their own minds despite having no conscious memory of either learning or acting upon them. Another example of racism is found in bullying. Educators and psychologists are responding to an increase in bullying in many different ways. Treating bullying as a signal of impending mental disorder or, or as an outward expression of home abuse helps psychologists identify and correct the problem before it becomes even more overt. Educators have developed ingenious group learning methods to break bullying and, and other types of racist type attitudes. One successful program has a group of high school age students arbitrarily choose a trait to discriminate against, while those of the opposite trait are permitted and even encouraged to belittle the ones who have that trait. For example, a blue-eyed people uh, might be targeted as objects of hate because those with blue eyes, blueies, are not as intelligent, have, have trouble socializing, and can't get good jobs because they are inferior by nature in comparison to the chosen ones, the superior brown-eyed people. Not long into the facilitated group session, it becomes apparent how easy it is to bully others and how harmful no matter the criteria, people who wear glasses or who are not as smart or conversely are too smart. There could be no bullying without previously learned racist type thinking. It is valuable to work toward breaking down the interplay of dark compassion and racist attitudes in order to get a handle on the serious problem of bullying which is a close cousin. If we could secretly follow some bullies for a while, we would certainly notice that they don't harass everyone. It isn't that they hate everyone because they make strong distinctions between the people who are worthy and respected and those who by comparison are not worthy, while the rest who, don't, who do not fall into either group don't matter one way or the other. Both bullies and racists need that special defining characteristic, characteristic to differentiate the perceived inferior group from the respected group in order to justify a public showing of perfect loyalty and compassion for their own group. With strong determination and a high quality meditation practice, we alone can decide what kind of a person we want to be At some point in our studies of the Buddha's teachings on compassion, we will make a connection between true compassion and equanimity. If we honestly want to confront our own racist attitudes, equanimity will help us diminish or erase ideas such as these people are worthy and those are not, while letting go of any potentially dangerous vestiges of racism that we may still harbor. In short, equanimity closes the distance between others and ourselves. This result will be a broader scope of finding worthiness in others that literally compels us to benefit them on an equal basis. Others with less equanimity, compassion, might believe that doing for others would be exhausting but there are time-tested and well-documented benefits of helping others. Not only does it make others happier, but it also increases our own capacity for happiness as a welcome and unexpected byproduct. A strict society disapproves of those who think for themselves and, and, and have self-respect because autonomy makes people more difficult to control. If everyone respected themselves while practicing equanimity and compassion for others, war would be absolutely impossible. With compassion, it would also be unthinkable to take over lands or countries where large numbers of people already live peacefully. Just consider that it was only 60 years ago when Aboriginal Australians were given human status. Prior to that, they were classified, they were classified as farm animals 
and treat it as such. Stealing people from their own country and transporting them far away to use as slaves is, is also a blatant violation of universal principles of compassion and equanimity. Society in its, in its warlike form uses dark compassion as its guide and must own your loyalty in order to make you capable of killing another under the right circumstances. If you refuse or simply cannot do so due to your own standards, you can become a societal outcast by virtue of upholding the wrong kind of compassion and perhaps making others look bad. To be a really good citizen, you must go along with every single attitude which is disseminated. Don't get me wrong, I think society is a great idea, and it's also an unstoppable force of evolutionary change. A definition of society should also include its identity as a spontaneous acceptance of well-established moral opinions. The regretful truth is that our present society lags behind and is still functioning within the moral imperatives to change from 50 years ago. The outcasts of decades ago who demanded change have perhaps finally gotten their wishes, as some of their ideas are now societal norms, although often in diluted forms. Examples of earlier progressives and muckrakers are those advocates for recycling and those crazy people warning us to prevent climate change. A parallel can be drawn to the lives of Tibetan Buddhist masters called Mahasiddhas. These wandering saints were enlightened beings and, and harbingers of change, but Tibetan people of their, their time just thought they were crazy. The Mahasiddhas spoke and acted in ways that did not conform to societal norms of their time, so their actions did not make sense to most people. A hundred years later, long after they had passed away, well, while well, people still consider them to be crazy, a society changed its mind and was able to view their motives and methods more clearly. In every time and culture, at the cusp of change, intelligent and forward-thinking people can influence others to slowly put new values into practice. Eventually, more people considered the Mahasiddha's ideas to be acceptable, and even later, those ideas became the rules. The same will be true in the future for some of the seemingly radical but valuable and catalytic ideas of today. Buddha Shakyamuni was at the forefront of change also. Although we now think of the Buddha as he is depicted in statues of very peaceful, smiling, and with no problems, the Buddha was a radical of his time because of his opposition to the Vedas and the caste system. During that era, upper-class Brahmins had a stranglehold on all of society. A, a good life was for and about Brahmins while everyone else was in servitude. The Brahmins were on top, and those of the untouchable caste were on the bottom rung. In some ways, perhaps Buddha Shakyamuni became awakened in order to change this extremist form of racism. In so many words, the Buddha said, there must be a better way than the caste system. What if there was no high and no low? What if misogyny did not exist? If women were free and did not belong to their fathers, <clears throat> then to their husbands, and if their husband died, the mother went to their eldest son? Under these radical proposals, for the first time, women could choose a spiritual career, and even low-caste shudras could become monks. The Buddha was so unpopular with the ruling Brahmins that some wanted to kill him, and they actually tried many times. One might still consider, continue to believe that the Buddha had a perfectly peaceful life. But even his own cousin, Devadatta, tried to kill him on numerous occasions and nearly succeeded. 
However, because of the Buddha's enlightened compassion and deep sense of the rightness of equanimity, it was natural for him to suggest that people look at the issue of inequality differently. It was hard for the Buddha to get the people of his time to change, and it's still challenging to accomplish this today. One of the very best methods is to present the teachings that offer a higher view of compassion and are based in equanimity that is potent enough to be capable of eradicating racism in ourselves. This is our precious Buddhist tradition, still firmly rooted in the radical ideals of change. Earlier, I described society as an accepted collection of attitudes and moral opinions. We can also see that families with their own sets of demands, with their own, with our miniature versions of larger society. Although family members have their quirks, through family ties, we are bound to respect and honor their attitudes, whether that is reciprocal or not. Perhaps the Brahmanical model is still with us now revealed differently through poor family power dynamics. Someone is in charge and makes all the rules and someone else is at the bottom with little chance to do as they please. Maybe they're the youngest or there's another reason that they have become the untouchable caste or the black sheep. But still, they're part of the family. Sometimes the family member with spiritual longings is made fun of for their wacky ideals of compassion. If family members are close, there also is love and respect for each other. Uh, that is, uh, until one of them disrupts normal family roles and becomes the wacky misfit in search of wholeness. If this describes our own situation with family, we must be careful not to be harsh and discriminatory simply because our, our family or loved ones don't understand our motives. The altruistic view <clears throat> described in Mahayana Buddhism advises us to become more skillful when dealing with unfriendly people, those who don't accept us or those who are overly demanding. It is possible to be a meditator and still have good relationships with difficult people. Altruistic compassion practiced in the face of poor relationships actually can make us better listeners and helped us to choose our words more carefully. One aspect of a compassionate attitude is not feeling inconvenienced. If you regularly feel the irritation of being inconvenienced or put upon, that, that attitude becomes an important element that defines those relationships. The problem isn't that people are trying to get your attention by interrupting. They, they want your attention because you have good advice and are good at doing things. If they did not want your attention, it would be because you don't know anything, they don't like you, or they just don't want to be around you. But of course that's not true. Feeling inconvenienced is not so much about their action, their actions, but it in instead reflects a problem in you an attitude that is probably making you all tight and weaselly. Another way to describe not feeling inconvenienced is to have kindness toward others. We cannot stop people from bothering us because they can't find their socks, but we can fix our annoyed feeling each time somebody wants something. We will never find some magical culture of kindness that will make us feel more comfortable until we are sufficiently kind ourselves. If we begin by relaxing more when we are around others instead of tightening up, it will be surprising how many kind people we will encounter. If we make a promise by saying, from now on, I will always be kind, that might be premature as there will still be times when we will be irritable. We don't even have to feel irritated with our own lack of development. We can just relax and then relax again. Even if family or others are not so happy with your decision to meditate daily, eventually there will be no way for them to avoid noticing how kind you are becoming. 
They may even encourage you to make more time for yourself because you are becoming more likable, more, more peaceful, and more calm. Kind people invite an atmosphere of calm and contentment into their own lives and into the lives of those around them as well. Those same people following whatever spiritual path they choose are the ones who will continue in the spirit of the teachings of the Buddha with the certainty that ultimately true compassion will win over everyone. I think perhaps a great number of people who are watching this, students or friends who are already Buddhist, please do not set aside your Buddhist values of kindness and compassion in face of these extreme difficulties that we had. I was in my just previous life in 1959 and afterwards I was uh, personal knowledge of great difficulties, even more difficult than what is being experienced right now, although I'm sure you find that hard to believe. Maintaining uh, equanimity, kindness, and compassion was a real struggle at that time. And yet those who were able to do it succeeded spiritually and with safety uh, continued their spiritual development up until today, wherever they may be. Please do not give up meditation. Do not give up your concern for the welfare of all sentient beings. Do not remove even a single sentient being from your, uh, from your care. Please be careful yourself. Please do not riot. Please do not harm others. Please do not think so badly of others that it disturbs your mind and makes you incapable of true compassion. Do not go to the dark side. Do not go to dark compassion. Do not buy into uh, mob mentality. Please be careful. I pray for the welfare of all of my students, my friends, and all living beings during these difficult times. Thank you for listening. Much love.